Hi, I'm Rebecca Valcarcel. Let's talk about Toni Morrison's short story, Recitative. First of all, the title. A recitative in an opera is a portion of the opera where the formal singing stops and we just have a character singing in a more conversational way with a more conversational rhythm, just imparting some information. Twyla here is delivering little portions out of the whole opera of her life, we might say, little conversational parts where she talks to us and just explains in a fairly casual way how the next encounter with Roberta is going, what happened, and so on. It's an interesting title and an interesting form for a short story. Now, in these episodes, we see that the friendship between these two women is explored over the span of their entire lives. What's going on with these two characters? First of all, the race issue. Morrison has been quite clever here in not telling us what race Twyla and Roberta are. We see that they're different races. She says that they're like salt and pepper standing next to each other. So we know that one is African American, one is Caucasian, and we're wondering throughout the story which is which. And our wondering makes us try to find little clues and figure it out. So maybe we have the first clue is Twyla's name. And we think, oh, well, maybe I have the impression that a name like that must belong to an African American. But then later, I find out that Twyla lives in a suburb that is predominantly Caucasian. So I'm thinking, no, maybe she's white. And then one of the mothers cooks chicken. And you think, well, is that a black culture thing? Or maybe white people eat chicken too. So no. And then you're thinking, well, the one lady wears green pants. Maybe that tells us her race. But then you think, not necessarily. Women who are religious, does that mean she's black? Does that mean she's white? Toni Morrison is playing with us because as we go through trying to find these clues, all we do is realize our own stereotypes and we realize, oh, you know, I'm trying to see if a woman who dresses like this or does these things must be a certain race. When in fact, it's very hard to tell. And as soon as you think, oh, I've got it, then you realize, no, wait, maybe I don't. Even when the two women are on opposite sides of a picket line, when they're protesting the integration of schools, one is for, one is against, we're still not sure. So Toni Morrison has left off this information on purpose, showing us that race, in a way, doesn't matter. What matters is that they have an issue about it. So while we can't even tell what race they are, to them, it's quite important. I think Morrison is saying, race doesn't matter. What matters is that people are hung up on race. Okay, so number two, Maggie. What is Maggie doing in the story? And why does the reference to Maggie get that prominent place of the very last line of the story? At the last moment, Roberta says, what happened to Maggie? And she is very troubled by her memory of what happened to Maggie. Now Maggie is mute, possibly deaf. She may have a mental challenge as well. She may be black. One of them remembers her as black. The other friend remembers her as non-black. So her race is also in question. Maggie's disability trumps race. Maggie's disability is why she gets beaten up by the Gar girls. When she's being beaten up, Twyla, only eight years old, remembers not the beating up, but just that Maggie fell. She's protecting herself from remembering what really happened by telling herself, Maggie fell. Later, Roberta says, no, that's not what happened. Don't you remember? She was being beaten up. And as they piece this memory together over time, we do realize that Maggie was being cruelly treated, abused by these girls, and Twyla and Roberta did not help her and did not tell any of the adults who might have helped Maggie. They did not actually participate in the beating, but they wanted to. And Roberta is honest enough with herself to admit that she wanted to participate 
and that wanting to is the same as doing it, she says. Now, Twyla knows that she didn't actually participate in the beating, but she admits to herself that she wanted to, too. And it's kind of scary because you realize these are eight-year-olds who are nevertheless feeling this desire to hurt another person. Now, what is that about? And maybe this story is actually about that impulse, not about race, really, not about class, which is another issue between these two women. One is rich, one is poor. They, they managed to deal with that. But what about this woman who's disabled? How come that triggers so much cruelty on the part of other people? Or why are people feeling like they can beat her and put her down when it's not just because of her race, it's really because of her disability? Well, let's examine that. First of all, I think Twyla relates Maggie to her own mother. When we're asking, why does Twyla want to hurt Maggie, this poor woman, and she feels guilty about it later, but why would eight-year-old Twyla want to hurt this woman? Well, she says, Maggie is like my mother dancing. And her mother dancing, even though dancing sounds rather positive, we know that that actually translated into neglect of Twyla. So a woman who is not effective in the world, who is not able to take care of her child, a woman who is vulnerable and non-functional makes her mad. So Maggie, being non-functional, stands in for this non-functioning mother and she hates that. So that's one reason that Twyla has anger toward this poor, defenseless, disabled woman, Maggie. Now there's another comment that Twyla makes. She says that Maggie couldn't scream just like me. So she's referring to Maggie as similar to herself. Here she is, neglected, uh, having a really tough time, but she can't scream. She can't really express herself. And that hatred of the silence may be another reason that she wants to attack Maggie. She, she doesn't like that silence, that muteness. She doesn't want to be mute, and she's angry with herself for not screaming and not you know, standing up for herself or whatever it is she wants to express, she's not expressing. So she takes it out on Maggie. Now remember she doesn't actually beat Maggie, but she remembers wanting to. So there's another possibility of why she would want to. She sees Maggie as her mother, she sees Maggie as herself, and she doesn't like that part of herself that's mute and vulnerable. All right, what else about Maggie? Roberta also admits to wanting to hurt Maggie, and she feels guilty about it. Now, her motivations, we don't have as much insight into. Morrison does not put us in Roberta's head, but Roberta obviously is angry also at powerlessness because she's powerless. So Maggie's powerlessness reminds her of her own powerlessness, so she's angry and wants to, wants to beat that up powerlessness itself. Her mother is sick, also ineffective, also not taking care of her, so she may have similar issues. Does Maggie's race make Roberta even more likely to want to brutalize her? I don't think so. Roberta does remember Maggie as black, but it doesn't seem that Maggie's race is really the key thing here. The main element is Maggie's helplessness and her disability. Now, why does anyone want to beat up a disabled person? This is just human cruelty, right? And maybe Toni Morrison is drawing our attention to the fact that while we may deal with our own prejudice when it concerns race and class, we can't forget that we are still capable of cruelty, perhaps to disabled folks, perhaps to some other group, but it's that potential for cruelty and the tendency to dehumanize another person that is the real problem. So here we have Maggie being the other, the, the person we're going to blame and, and we're going to hate. And that's a problem when inside ourselves, inside those eight-year-old girls and inside all of us, there is that potential to dehumanize someone else and be cruel to them, then we have a societal problem, we have a, a spiritual problem. When these women realize 
that they had a moral lapse that day. They should have helped. They know they should have. It's important that they're honest enough to admit that while they weren't having an issue with race right then, they still were having a moral lapse of a different kind. They were cruel to someone else whose humanity they could diminish. Okay, so one more aspect of this story. We've talked about the race issue. We've talked about Maggie. Now I want to mention the orchard. Twyla says she dreams about the orchard. She describes the trees in the orchard. When she arrives, she says that they're crooked beggar women, that the trunks are, you know, crooked and the trees are rather ugly. By the time Roberta leaves, the trees are in full bloom, there's blossoms. She remembers the smell very fondly. And this orchard is something that fills her mind and fills her memory. So, what do orchards mean? Well, I'm thinking that it relates to a pristine environment that's quite beautiful, that implies innocence, and also the, the young woman that she wants to become, that Twyla wants to grow into. We see the teenagers using it as a place to dance and play the radio. They're kind of more free out there in the orchard. But the orchard is also the place where Maggie fell, or actually was brutalized. So rather like Eden, we have this idyllic picture of the orchard with the flowers and so on, and the freedom of these young women. But we also have a problem where someone fell. And in the whole mythology of the Eden story, we have the fall of humankind, where there's a moral lapse and a disobedience to moral laws. And the brutalization of Maggie, the beating up of this disabled woman, is certainly a moral lapse and is certainly the moment when Twyla loses her innocence because for the first time she knows what it is to want to be cruel. And that is her fall in a sense. It is her moral misstep that she feels guilty about. And Roberta feels the same way. So the story ends with this sadness about Maggie, about how they lost in that orchard their compassion, they lost their humanity, they lost themselves. This is the crux of the story here, is this question, how is it that we can be compassionate, that we can be humane with one another, when we do have these deep human threads of darker behavior and, and and cruelty. We need to face that in ourselves in order to make this world a better place. Well, those are some of my ideas about this story, and I know you have some. Feel free to put them in the comments, and join me for another video sometime.